great to be with you on another episode of Dr. Me First. I'm your colleague in medicine and your coach in life, Dr. Aaron Wiseman, and I am here to help you move from a place of burnout, brokenness, and despair to one that is joy-filled, sustainable, and that you absolutely freaking love. I'm so excited that you join me for another podcast episode where we have conversations with other amazing female physicians and healthcare providers about what they're doing in the world, how they're taking care of themselves, and what you can learn from them to better doctor yourself first. So in today's episode today, I am talking with the amazing Christy Bartlett. That's right. Dr. Bartlett. And the cool story with how we met is that she posted an amazing blog post online. And when I read it, I literally about peed my pants. I thought, oh my God, her life is like my life. She was talking about being a doctor mom and all the intricacies with that. And I right away emailed her and I was like, you have to come on my podcast. So today, what we're going to talk about and the word that she's bringing is perspective. So jump into this conversation with us and then stick around afterwards for that kick of encouragement. Okay, here we go. podcast, Dr. Christy Bartlett. It's so nice to have you on Dr. Me First. Tell them all about yourself and the amazing sauce that you bring into this world. (laughs) So I am Christy Bartlett. I um, live in Kansas City. I am married to a stay-at-home dad. I've got three kiddos, nine, six, and two. And I am a hospice and palliative medicine physician um, at an academic medical center. And I spend most of my time in the hospital doing consults, and then I also see patients um, at one of our local hospice houses. So that's kind of that's kind of me. I love it. You know, we have a, like a Casey connection, right? Just so you know. Yeah, with Erica. With Erica, and I went to med school in Kansas City too. <gasps> Did you really? Mm-hmm. Yep, I'm a DO wonderful. from KCUMB. So there you oh, go. Oh, wonderful! I don't think I got to experience the city as as cool as it is because you know I was in med school and grinding away. Mm-hmm. But I I have been back a few times, and it's just such a fun town. Yeah, it's awesome. I love it here. Well, good. All right. Well, your word today is perspective. Why'd you pick that one? Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, perspective. I, I find that it is just important to have perspective in life. It relates to so many different things. Um, I actually came across a meme the other day and it said perspective can be prison or your passport. Um, and it's all kind of in the way that you look at things um, and what, what view you take. And I think that my job as a hospice and palliative care doctor gives me kind of an obnoxious amount of perspective all day, every day. Because when you're dealing with, you know, the saddest, most tragic cases, um, it, it's hard to go home and be upset about, you know, your kids spilling their milk. Um, so I feel like perspective really just it gives you a better outlook on life if you can have good perspective. Do you think your perspective has changed over the past couple of years? Um, I think it has. I think kind of getting through training and, and being an attending, I think it has. I think you worry so much during your training years, and it's kind of hard to find big picture perspective when you're, <laughs> you've slept for four hours and you have to get up to round at six o'clock. But I think the last five years of being an attending, I've been able to kind of take a step back um, and just appreciate the small things in life and just be really grateful for kind of the life that I have. Mm-hmm. So we're talking perspective. So my brain is like, I really want to ask you like, you sound like such a cheerful person, I guess is what I say. <laughs> I, I like to think of myself as and, a cheerful person, I, yeah. I'm looking at, because I'm the same way. Like, I, I can be cheerful, but I can also be super grumpy and bitchy about things. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's just perfectly honest. Like, I'm a fun family doctor, but then there's times that I'm not such a fun family doctor. Sure, sure. So as you're thinking about this perspective, have you blogged on it? You know, not not too much, not too much. That's something that I'm, 
I'm working on. But I, you know, just as an example of kind of my approach to perspective and how it can change sometimes. So a couple years ago, there was a big flood in Kansas City and Westport flooded. And, you know, I'd been on service all week and we just had some really awful, you know, like think young people, horrible cancer, young moms, you know, that are dying. And so that was kind of my week. And my husband and I had kind of, we were sitting on the couch, um, watching a movie, drinking some coffee and we'd gone upstairs and kind of came back down to the basement to turn things off before we went to bed. And our basement was flooding in the process of flooding. And I just remember thinking like, well, that kind of sucks, but like my kids are upstairs, they're sleeping, they're happy, they're healthy, you know? And I was, I just had this like moment of like realization of perspective. And I was like, I could, you know, flip my shit right now and be like, oh my God, my basement's flooding. But I just had this like really calm, you know, reaction to it. I think my husband was looking at me like, uh, you going to panic there a little bit. Um, so I think that helps me put things in perspective. Now the next morning, of course, when we go down and the restoration people are there ripping up my carpet and my baseboards and you start to feel or start to smell the, the kind of musty smell in the air, I, I lost a little perspective in that moment. But, um, you know, I think those things are transient. They happen. We're going to have, you know, shitty things that happen in our lives. But ultimately, when you look at, you know, what's important and, you know, my happy, healthy kids and, you know, that they have a roof over the head. I was like, okay, things, things could be worse. Yeah, absolutely. I have a water in the basement, not losing my shit story too. So yeah. we had the same thing. We bought a home, you know, after I got out into practice, after residency, it was like the house. We loved it. It was under our price range. So good. Within a month of moving in, basement flooding. Oh, they they lied to us. And like <sighs> the home inspector totally missed it. And like after the fact, yeah, like there's this huge three inch gap, like in our basement wall. <sighs> going to leak, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, and that's, I'm that's not a cheap easy you. fix. Like that's by taking the perspective or the mindset to be like, if this is the worst thing that is happening in my life, we're okay. Yeah. Versus being like, holy shit, there's water in my basement every time. Life is over. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, I know, cause I do this life coachy thing and sometimes I get some criticisms from people like the power of positivity, you know, like you can think your problems away. People get really like poo poo and upset about that. And typically be it's because I think they feel like it's me attacking their experience or they almost want to like hold on to that perspective of mm -hmm. the shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like in, in the middle of the shit river. How do yeah, you, sometimes it can be, sometimes it can be fun to be Debbie Downer and whine and complain about things. I mean, that it can be enticing sometimes. You just have to, I think, work your way through it. How do you come across that with patients? Because I mean, you have to be one of the first line people that after they've gone through their devastating diagnosis that they've got, that they know that they're either nearing the end of their life or that you're going to be transitioning with them towards those last days. How do you deal with people with perspective? Yeah, um, that's challenging. And certainly everyone facing end of life approaches it a little bit differently. Um, some approach it, you know, just grasping with whatever strength they have to not face it and to just hang on for another day. And others face it with, you know, kind of a sense of opportunity, the opportunity to have a period of time that you can do what you want to do with the knowledge that your time is short. Um, but it can be empowering for people with that knowledge and they can say, okay, where do I want to be? who do I want to be with? Like, what do I want to accomplish in these final few days or weeks? And how can I make this really meaningful? So I think, you know, trying very gently to frame things for people so they understand that they have that opportunity. Certainly not, you know, coming in all rainbows and sunshine and be like, hey, you know, you got stage four pancreatic cancer. Here's the good news. You know, like that's, that's not going to fly. But just trying to gently frame, frame it to empower people. Absolutely. Why'd you pick palliative? Oh, golly. Um, you know, I think just a series of serendipitous events led me to this. Um, when I was doing my pre-med work, I happened to volunteer at a hospice um, and I loved it. And then kind of as I went through medical school, I just had encounter after encounter with the palliative care department here and they just kind of felt like my people. Um, and then during residency, kind of same thing. And I did a, um, an elective with the palliative care team and I had, um, an experience with a family and the the patient had been in a really bad accident and had a high C-spine fracture and was on life support. And 
you know, just having the opportunity to talk with that family and for them to be able to voice what his wishes had been that he had so clearly elaborated to them previously and just to walk them through that end of life process was so, so meaningful. And the patient's daughter actually like grabbed me by the shoulders, looked me in the eye and was like, this is what you're meant to do. And I was like, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and that's just where I felt, I always tell medical students, I'm like, look at the specialties where you feel like you are the most helpful. Not that you're going to make the most money, not that's the most glamorous, but where do you feel the most helpful? And for me, that's sitting down and talking to people and managing symptoms. You know, for someone else that might be, you know, cutting someone's Cracking brain, open chest. brain open or something. I don't know. So, so that's yeah. kind of how I stumbled into it. And I, I love it. Amazing. You know, because that's the thing in your division of medicine. There's not a lot of curing, but there's definitely a lot of healing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The other day, um, we had a patient who had just cut his hand and it wouldn't stop bleeding. He was in the hospital and I ordered some thrombin spray and I like, I fixed his bleeding hand. And that was the first time in a really long time that I actually felt like I fixed anything. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> You need to like get down to the ER every so often and put a few staples in people. To oh, sweet fulfilled. heavens. That place <laughs> terrifies me. I've got some girlfriends who do ER like in the inner city in Kansas City. I'm like, how do you do this all day every day? Ah. I know. And it's so good because we need everybody from every walk, you know, to do the jobs that we're doing. That's for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I love it so much. What else can you give me on perspective here that you kind of come into the conversation and thought about before we got on here? Yeah. So something just professionally that I've become aware of in the last several months was just my perspective on my job. And I've always kind of told myself, which now I've discovered is selling myself short. I just want to be a doctor. I just want to take care of patients. You know, I've come up through this academic institution and, you know, there's the expectation for scholarly work and that's just kind of not my jam. Um, I love taking care of patients. I love working with learners and doing education. Um, but the scholarly stuff hasn't been my thing. And I've always just been like, I just, I just want to be a doctor. Um, and it occurred to me in the last few months, like in what world is finishing undergrad, finishing four years of med school, three years of residency, a year of fellowship, in what world is that just being a doctor? So I put some different perspective on that. And I'm like, that, no, like stop telling yourself that. Like you're a doctor. I'd like to think I'm a pretty darn good one. And like that is enough. Like that's good. And if, you know, if the scholarly stuff isn't there, like it's okay. Like because I'm, I'm doing my thing in the other, you know, aspects. So I have tried to really stop using the word just. Like, you know, if you go to Starbucks and you order just a latte, like, okay, you can use the word just, but that's really the only application for that word. Absolutely. I've been working on the word saying sorry, like, a, like mm. inadvertently apologizing really in a situation that doesn't need an apology, but yet somehow sure. we always seem to like insert a, a sorry kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's been oh, hard yeah. to like read. That is myself. hard. Yeah. You get on an elevator and like. You go, oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm here. You know, yeah. Don't, apo don't apologize for your existence. No, exactly. And don't just say you're just a doctor. Right. Absolutely. I, I struggle with that. I still catch myself doing it and I'm, I'm trying really hard not to. Well, I think because it's so easy that you've lived in that perspective for so long, like the readjusting the lenses takes a little bit of time. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I'm, and I've, glad that I recognized it. And I'm glad I'm working through it. And I feel like I can advocate for myself more instead of taking a more passive, like, oh, I'm, I'm just this, like, bear with me. I'm, you know, I'm a valued member of our team. I, I do a good job clinically. Like that's, that's who I am. That's my identity. And I'm good with that. Yeah. I love it. Well, let's jump a little bit more into talking about your blog, where it started, your vision for it, all that goodness. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So my blog started um, during medical school, I think. It was titled Out the, out the Winder because my dogs would sit in the, in the winder and look out. And, but somebody had already taken the name Out the Window. So I had to modify it. Um, so I kept that up for a little bit just as a way to kind of document my med school experience. And I had my first baby my fourth year of med school. So just kind of becoming a parent and a doctor. Um, so 
that one kind of went by the wayside and I actually couldn't figure out how to log back into that blog to like retake it over. So I have a new one and it's drbartlettpair.com. I always introduce my, uh, myself to patients as Dr. Bartlett and I say like a pair and I draw a little pair on their whiteboard in their room and I answer to Dr. Pear. So that's where that came from. Um, and so far it's been a mix of just my life and life as a mom, life as a doctor, some reflections on different patient, you know, encounters. The big thing in our life right now is my daughter's a competitive dancer and just the, um, I consider myself the reluctant dance mom and just the woes of glitter and, you know, rhinestone fake eyelashes and all that business. So it's my outlet to, to talk about those things. And I also kind of hope that over the years, this will be kind of a, just a recorded history of my life. So my kids and my grandkids at some point for better or worse can look back and be like, Oh gosh, mom was, mom was a little crazy, <laughs> so, yeah. but at least have a little bit of history of the things that I did and said. That's so good. I love your blog. I love getting in there because I feel like even though you don't don't attest to it. You're such an eloquent writer. And like, I can oh, see the stories that you're telling about your children, like playing out in my head and I love them so much. So I will oh, definitely make sure there's a you. link in the show notes to the, to your blog. And specifically, I, I probably honestly, am going to link up the blog that first caught my attention because it's too hilarious. Not to oh, awesome. everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else to add at the end of this? Oh gosh. I think that's all I've, that's what I've got. That's what we got. We got perspective. That's for We've sure. We've got perspective today. <laughs> Love it. for your kick of encouragement wake up call after that wonderful conversation well thanks to dr bartlett for coming on the podcast i know that she was a little bit reluctant but she did a bomb job and hey another shout out to my kc people okay well let's get into it kick of encouragement today perspective i love the quote that she gave perspective can be a prison or a passport Ooh, that one kind of hit me deep. I'm not going to lie about that. Many times my perspective has been my own self limitations. It's been things that I've placed upon myself. And by getting out of our head, by seeing that our perspective is limiting us, it really can open up to a new world. Like when you get a, your new passport and it's all fresh and your picture looks great and you don't have any new stamps in it yet. It's amazing what a shift in just mind perspective can do. So I ask you, what perspective have you been in lately? Has it been Debbie Downer or has it been Happy Henrietta? I don't know. I would just ask you though to step back a little bit and assess your situation. What's really going on underneath the surface? Sometimes that takes, you know, just getting really quiet with yourself. For me, a lot of times I sit down and look at my calendar when I'm feeling overwhelmed and kind of grouchy. And then by getting that awareness and perspective of, oh my God, my calendar is absolutely crazy. It's no wonder why I'm tired, why I'm a little bit snippy, why I'm not handling things well. So do that step for yourself. Sit back, get some awareness. The next thing what I want you to do is also to talk with somebody be it a friend, a colleague, somebody that you haven't talked to in forever, a coach, a mentor, maybe it's a spiritual advisor, maybe it's your mom, whatever. I want you to just talk with somebody and kind of just do a check-in. Have them ask you some questions on where your headspace is, what's been going on, maybe what's that internal head game that's playing with you, and really get a good look on your perspective. Because, you know, honestly, all changes, all transitions, all shifts, almost 100% of the time start internally. Okay, now granted, there's those crazy things that just pop out of the bushes and scare the shit out of you and you don't know even know where it came from and you just get horrific bad news totally out of the blue. We're not talking about those situations. We're talking about all the rest of the parts of life. When you kind of get that little feeling inside when you're like, yeah, things are just not sitting right or something's going on. I'm telling you, 
getting perspective on your internal environment. I mean, I really wish there was a lab draw that we could do like all this mindset work on where I could just like pull a level off and then give you the right things to even it all out. Would that not be like the best job ever? Oh, wait, that's kind of what we do in other circumstances. But hang with me on this. You know, so much of the time, we've just got to clean out that headspace. And if it's something that you're struggling with, I want you to know you're not alone. We all are dealing with it on different levels. It's just some have found a different way of managing it and a different perspective for which they look for at life. And therefore, they are happier. They have more joy and life is more sustainable because they're living it in a more aligned way. So if that's something you're interested in, check out the links. Schedule a call with me. I'd love to talk with you. Let me tell you, it's not selling. There's no sleaze. It's just you and me talking, kind of like you heard me and Bartlett talking on this podcast. And I'd love to do it with you anytime, all the time. If you don't find a time, then just email me. It's there too. All right, friends. Well, I hope this has been a great podcast for you. I want to give a special thanks to our new music from Grace Misa and Vincent Tone, thank you so much for our awesome new intros, our outros. And I want to give a shout out to Jen Eads. She is the amazing broad at the Brassy Broadcasting Company. She's the one who got me started in podcasting. And without her, I would not be able to do this. So thank you so much, Jen. You mean so much to me. Okay. And like always, friends, please remember, your life, your calling, your pulse matters. Time to check out with that new music again. I'm going to insert the really long one so you can listen to the whole song if you want to. Okay, catch you on the flip side in the next episode. See ya!